In the beginning of things, when mankind started to populate the earth, the man Gikuyu, the founder of the tribe, was called by the Mogai, the divider of the universe, and was given as his share the land with the ravines, the rivers, the forests, the game and all the gifts that the Lord of Nature bestowed on mankind. At the same time, Mogai made a big mountain, which he called Kerinyaga. As his resting place went on inspection tour and as a sign of his wonders. It is probable that Kerinyaga, or Mount Kenya, wasn't seen by a white man until the middle of the 19th century. This part of the world was one of the last to be discovered by Europe. Even the slave trade had left it fairly undisturbed. On the sweeping highland plains, great nomadic tribes lived with their herds. In the fertile hills, the planters reclaimed the land. Different peoples lived side by side, now in contact, now in isolation, now in conflict, now in cooperation. Jomo Kenyatta was born into this world at the very moment it began to crumble. In 1895, Britain declared a protectorate over Kenya, an area of Africa the size of France with a population of several million. Kamau Wangengi, now known as Jomo Kenyatta, was among them. His birth date is uncertain, but it must have been a few years either side of 1895. As a boy, I received the usual education of Kikuyu boys. Following the tribal custom, I had to pass through several stages of initiation, and I can therefore speak from personal experience of the rites and ceremonies. Kenyatta's childhood was spent within sight of Kerenyaga. Around him, the British government imposed its rule upon the people, using guns and barbed wire whenever treaties and persuasion failed. The first European I saw was a European who quarreled with my father. The European became very angry and he tried to shoot my father. When the European comes to Gikuyu country and robs the people of their land, he is taking away not only their livelihood, but the material symbol that holds family and tribe together. In doing this, he gives one blow which cuts away the foundations from the whole of Gikuyu life, social, moral, and economic. It wasn't only settlers and administrators who disrupted the pattern of African life. Christian missionaries, too, spread out across the colony, building churches and schools. Kenyatta went to the Church of Scotland mission at Kikuyu, not far from his home. He had trouble with his leg, and while he was in the hospital here, he came to like education. He joined the school in August, entered the dormitory, and became a pupil. He was practicing carpentry while attending lessons in the classroom. As far as religion was concerned, the African was regarded as a clean slate on which anything could be written. He was supposed to take wholeheartedly all religious dogmas of the white man and keep them sacred and unchallenged no matter how alien to the African mode of life. Kikuyu parents were reluctant to send their children to school because they thought they would become Europeans. 
The missionaries used employment to induce us to attend classes. We were paid money, which we gave to our parents to buy goats. Before then, money was unknown in our society. Kenyatta emerged from the mission in 1914 with a new name, a Christian name, Johnston. Known as K.N. Johnston or Johnston Kamau, he set out on the career for which he had been prepared, a minor servant of the colonial economy. In those days, white settlers or white people were not happy to see Africans try to improve their way of life. And considering my brother, he was one of those people who had their early education, who could read and write. And with understanding, if not a university uh, education. And he was looked on among us advanced or educated people. He used to wear a large hat, usually worn by South Africans, and he also wore a jumper coat. He carried a rhinoceros hide whip. That was when he started wearing a belt decorated with beads of various colors. Such a belt is known as Kenyatta. He told people his name was Kenyatta. He was known thereafter as Kenyatta. And no one dared address him by any other name, or he might be beaten up. He was a bit of a bully, a ruffian, but not all that bad. He merely wanted to assert himself. There are so many incidents which took place during that time because he was only the, he was the first African to have a motorbike. And because some of the European who were in Kenya were not very happy about it, there were a time that there were collisions with those Europeans who see him in a motorbike. And because he doesn't want to be let down by them, well, he has to defend himself. Here yeah, again we see uh, my brother, very smartly dressed, and his young and only son, Peter Muigai Kenyatta, he was a very young little boy. Then his lovely lady, Wahu, or Grace Wahu. Mm. He was a young man, a very nice man, a jolly sort of fellow who loved others very much. He also liked farming. He is a farmer. He grows anything, fruit, maize, everything. We lived in Nairobi as a young bride. I had to be given pleasure. Those were really good times. He had no dependents other than myself and our son, Peter. I knew that my father hated discrimination. And again, he was very active in doing things properly to show that even an African, although he's black or white, he can do exactly as what an European can do. There certainly are some progressive ideas among the Europeans. They include the ideas of material prosperity, of medicine and hygiene and literacy, which enables people to take part in world culture. But so far, the Europeans who visit Africa have not been conspicuously zealous in imparting those parts of their inheritance to Africans and seem to think that the only way to do it is by police discipline and armed force. <laughs> Thank you. 
The first organized African protest against British rule in Kenya occurred in 1922. Harry Thuku, another young man of the same generation as Kenyatta and with a similar background, spoke out against the alienation of African land for the exclusive use of white settlers, against the low level of African wages and against the native registration system. Thuku was arrested and deported without trial. His political party, the East African Association, which drew its membership from many different tribes, was banned. To prevent any further growth of nationalism, the colonial government now forced African politics onto a local and tribal level. When we formed the Kikuyu Central Association, Kenyatta was still an employee of the Nairobi municipality. We discovered that he was a clever man who knew the English language well. And since none of us could speak the language, we decided to engage his services. When we later appointed him Secretary General of our party, he was called into the government office and told, if you have become a member of that association, tell us right now and you will be fired. If you don't want to be fired, say so, and you will be prosecuted and imprisoned for contravening government employment regulations by joining a political association. Kenyatta agreed to give up his job. In social relationships in Kenya, Europeans are masters and Africans servants. The vast majority of these Philistine whites in Africa believe that relationship to be part of the natural order of human society. Anyone doubting this idea would be regarded as a Bolshevik. Kenyatta suggested that we start a newspaper, Mwigwidhanya, the Reconciler and the association approved his suggestion. Through our publication, people became aware of their rights and desired to demand their freedom. They found that they could never be satisfied with the colonial government's reaction in Kenya. They thus decided to send a representative to Britain. They had chosen me at first, but since discussions would be held in English, which I did not know, what would I say to the committees? We therefore decided to send Kenyatta. I was told to sign his security bond, which I did. It was Kenyatta whom we sent to Britain. Kenyatta's first major test as a politician came ironically while he was away from Kenya. A bitter conflict had broken out in his absence between the Protestant missions and their Kikuyu converts over the question of female circumcision, the Kikuyu custom of removing part of the clitoris. We were told that if we wanted to remain in the church, we should stop circumcising our girls. We objected to this because it was a sacred Kikuyu custom which could not be obliterated arbitrarily. We were excommunicated from the church and our children expelled from the missionary schools. And we had built many of the schools and churches ourselves. Kenyatta was called upon to mediate and went to see the leaders of the Church of Scotland mission in Edinburgh. He took the position that if it were a question of rejecting or modifying an inappropriate custom, then education was the way to produce the desired result. The force of law could not and should not be used to suppress such an important tradition. You could hear my father's, my father's name being mentioned in, the, in songs and dances which were danced by then, criticizing the missionary, one called Mufiregu, of which they used to say that uh, Jomo or Johnston Kamau will have a, a cup of tea with other natives. That's a Kanyua Shai native. That's to mean that you'll have the tea together with other natives. 
although he's in Britain. So his reputation was kept by those who knew what he was doing. Hendo ane gweta inye mudiri watiri na ma ito ne moru na ba ba ne moru ni ende moge koyo dinge garurandi. The government, on the other hand, looked upon the KCA as unrepresentative of African opinion and upon Kenyatta as an already dangerous agitator. He was in England at the time with a kind of commission from his people to represent them where and when he found useful. They would cable over the head of the district commissioner when there was a spot of trouble in any tribe in Kenya. It wasn't only the Kikuyu, certainly. And Joma would decide the right thing to do about it, whether to lobby members of parliament or write letters to the newspapers or mention it in public meetings. <laughs> He always sent us copies of his dealings with the colonial office and we kept him informed of what was happening here. Active agitation was forbidden and if we presented our grievances to the local administrative authorities, they never bothered to put things right. We could only agitate directly through London. There was a question of the Wakamba having had their land curtailed, we're now told that their cattle were too numerous and were causing soil erosion. Incidentally, Libby's had set up a canned beef factory on the edge of the land, and it was very convenient to have the cattle slaughtered. The Wakamba didn't find it so convenient, so they cabled Kenyatta, who got the particulars, and we made a lot more people in England aware of the kind of thing that was going on with letters to the New Statesman, the Guardian and what not and would certainly have known anything about it at all if it had been left to the government. The African is conditioned by the cultural and social institutions of centuries to a freedom of which Europe has little conception. It is not in his nature to accept serfdom forever. He realizes that he must fight unceasingly for his own complete emancipation, for without this, he is doomed to remain the prey of rival imperialisms. Britain transplants her institutions and functionaries with her flag, and when the acting governor opens the new law courts, Whig and judges' robes uphold the dignity of the occasion, and the chief justice makes a suitable oration. The garden party at Government House is the social event of the celebrations, which exhibit a characteristic temper of intense loyalty. All Europeans as such, and however uneducated, have votes. No African, however educated, has won. The education of all African children is restricted to what these European exploiters believe to be good for them. For instance, how to pick coffee with two hands. If you want winter sport unspoilt by organization and regimentation, you want to go to darkest Africa for it. You may not believe it, but there it is. Mount Kenya in the background. And we're going to try a bit of sheing practically on the equator. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness the All-African Sheing Championship. Now the experts show how it's done. Bright fellows who, before they took to empire building, did a spot of winter holidaying in Switzerland. Kenyatta's years abroad were a time of exploration and confirmation. He came under the influence of missionary contacts from Kenya, of communists, socialists and liberals, of pan-Africanists from America and the West Indies. He visited Germany just before Hitler assumed power and the Soviet Union during Stalin's program of rural collectivization. He studied at a Quaker college in Birmingham and at the London School of Economics. I knew him towards the end of the Depression. He certainly had taken it all in. 
One discussion I remember with some people in my flat who were taking the line that Africans were not civilized and pointing out as a mark of their barbarity the polygamous habits of the Kenya Africans. Jomo retorted, which is the more civilized, 50 wives or a hunger march? This was the kind of um, way that he'd seen England with, I think, with an anthropologist's eyes. By the late 1930s, Kenyatta's ideas began to crystallize and found expression in his book, Facing Mount Kenya. It was as much a political indictment of colonialism as an affirmation of the strength of traditional Kikuyu culture. In many ways, it was his declaration of independence as a nationalist. I am well aware that I could not do justice to the subject without offending those professional friends of the African who are prepared to maintain their friendship for eternity as a sacred duty, provided only that the African will continue to play the part of an ignorant savage so that they can monopolize the office of interpreting his mind and speaking for him. To such people, an African who writes a study of this kind is encroaching on their preserves. He is a rabbit turned poacher. He was a man who was sought after by many uh, Africans. They knew of his commitment, they were aware of his dedication, and many did so from a point of compensation. They wished they had his valor, they wished also they had his background, uh, so as to be able to appreciate the evils of colonialism to the extent that he was able to appreciate it. I don't know how early this sense of himself as so to speak the uncrowned king grew upon him but I know it was there very strongly I remember he once told me that um, in Kenya mothers would tell their children to soothe them when they were in distress Kenyatta coming Kenyatta's prospects for returning to Kenya were negligible by the time the Second World War began. His KCA colleagues, as well as the leaders of several other political parties, were detained without trial in 1940. Kenyatta's efforts to reform the political situation in Kenya by pressuring the British government in England appeared to have had no success. He moved out of London to Storrington, a Sussex village 40 miles to the south. He was absolutely cut off from supplies and almost absolutely from correspondence. While at Storrington, Kenyatta met and married his second wife, Edna Clark, an English governess. I think Edna encouraged him a great deal to take a, a job, and he took a job as a farm labourer. He got on famously with the other farm labourers. He worked harder, I should think, than any normal Englishman did, though I must say at the end of his first week he came home and told me that he hadn't known that English people could work as hard as his labouring friends did. He'd never seen them do anything like that in Kenya, you see. Kenyatta remained in Storrington throughout the war years, although he travelled frequently to lecture to searchlight brigades, workers' groups, and anyone else who would listen to him. In 1945, he took part in the 5th Pan-African Congress at Manchester, but he held himself back from any specific commitments. I think the time was coming near when he thought he would be going back to Kenya and that his first responsibility would be to his people, and he probably didn't want to take on obligations to the Pan-African world. 
that at the moment he was not going to be able to carry out. As he had done 15 years before, Kenyatta once again left his family, his friends, and a whole way of life. He returned to Kenya in September 1946. Kenyatta's first concern, however, when he had settled down, was not with politics, but with education. Seven months after his return, Kenyatta became principal of the independent African Teachers College at Githunguri. He also married again. <laughs> this is Mutundu, the younger wife of Kenyatta. And this is Kenyatta. And here I am, and this is my daughter Wambaki. We were photographed at Kithunguri when we were building the school for our children. When Kenyatta came back and went to Kithunguri, age groups were revived, the age groups based on circumcision time. Our main need then, our top priority was education for our children. This was our priority, because without education, it would have been impossible for us to demand our political rights. Our youth had to be sharpened. Could Kenyatta have gone to Europe if he hadn't been educated? Our main purpose was to educate our children, to be able to liberate our country from European occupation. We were like prisoners in our own land then. Kenyatta had returned at a moment when the climate for African politics seemed to be improving. The first African member of the Legislative Council had been appointed in 1944, and this had sparked the formation of a pan-tribal political organization, the Kenya African Union. Nothing like this had existed in the 1930s. He himself never imposed um, his authority on the masses to elect him on anything. He left them to choose, and in a very big meeting in Kaloreni Hall, where, where I presided, they unanimously elected him the president of the party. People respected him for the work he was doing for the country, not only for the Kikuyu, but for the country for, as a whole. And he was not speaking for Kikuyu, he was speaking for the Kenya as a whole. And through that, people came to consider him a man who is serving his people. At political rallies attended by tens of thousands, Kenyatta exhorted his followers to work hard, to be honest, to avoid theft and corruption, and so prepare themselves for self-government. There was a feeling in the time, particularly when Muzay's return, that we were making headway. They had tremendous confidence in, in him. They still have. And they, they, they saw in, the, in, in his movement and his speeches throughout the country that the future was brighter than ever. Kenyatta's basic belief in constitutional politics did not waver during this period in spite of pressure from some of his colleagues. In 1951 and 52, as other leaders began to go underground and to consider more militant tactics, Kenyatta held a series of meetings to denounce violence and Mau Mau. The Kenya African Union is not a fighting union that uses fists and weapons. If any of you here think that force is good, I do not agree with you. Remember the old saying that he who is hit with a club returns, but he who is hit with justice never comes back. The strength of these denunciations brought him at one point into direct confrontation with the underground leaders who warned him to temper his criticisms of their movement. The settlers, on the other hand, singled him out as a dangerous agitator who ought to be deported. In August 1952, they called for Kenyatta's arrest and for the declaration of a state of emergency. 
he really came to attention because of these enormous mass meetings and the tremendous demagogic power he had over the Kikuyu people and his ability really to make them do exactly as he wished or the, uh, project his ideas into them. That's really why he came to, to uh, attention. Two months later, in an atmosphere of panic, Kenyatta was arrested and charged with managing and being a member of an illegal society, Mao Mao. His trial went on for five months, while outside the courtroom, the British Army and Air Force and the Kenya police and settlers launched a bitter war against the Kikuyu. The reason for our arrest was not Mao Mao, but because they think we are going ahead uniting our people to demand our rights. The government arrested us simply because when they saw we could have an organization of 30,000 or 40,000 or more Africans demanding their rights here, they say, we've an excuse, Mao Mao. The trial was a very difficult trial because um, the British government had already, or the British, the Kenya government had already decided Mr. Kenyatta was guilty and it was just going through the form of a trial to convict him. The trial was held at Kapanguria, which is about 30 miles from Kitali. It's a little village and it was held in a schoolroom. And we had to motor every day 30 miles and back again in the evening. We couldn't stay in the only hotel in Kitali, which was reserved for Europeans at the time. We found it very difficult because the government had access to all the witnesses they needed. They actually had a camp in Kapanguria where the government witnesses were housed and coached. Uh, we had to get our witnesses from various parts of the country. And uh, it entailed every evening ringing Nairobi and asking our people here to arrange to, to find these witnesses and send them to Kapanguria. Um, naturally, the government, our line was tapped all the time and they knew who we were after. And we invariably found that when we went to look for this witness, he, was, he disappeared. He was not available anywhere. Um, we, had, we knew he was locked up somewhere in a, in a camp. He was picked up in order to frustrate the trial. Um, the judge who was um, conducting this trial had, re had retired, but he was brought in specially for this case uh, we were, he was well known to be anti-African and um, the irony of it is after he passed judgment that, that morning he had to leave the courthouse in an armored car and was not seen in Kenya again. You, Jomo Kenyatta, stand convicted of managing Mao Mao and being a member of that society. You have protested that your object has always been to pursue constitutional methods on the way to self-government for the African people and for the return of the land which you say belongs to the African people. I do not believe you. On April the 8th, 1953, Magistrate Ransley Thacker sentenced Kenyatta to seven years imprisonment with hard labor and recommended that he be restricted afterwards. Kenyatta was, in other words, never to be allowed to return to political life. Already well into his fifties, Kenyatta served his time at Lokitong, an isolated desert outpost in the arid north of Kenya. At Lokitong, he would encourage us and say that we should not despair because our land would be free. He told us it wasn't only in Kenya that people were imprisoned for demanding freedom. He had seen many leaders imprisoned, he said, and their countries still became free. Many things have been done to astound and frighten the heart. Yet although this is very sad, I feel that it is not right for a man to be filled with anger and disquieted in his heart. Because to do this is sheer folly. 
In my opinion, it is better to be calm and to forget evil and to look forward to the good which will follow when all these troubles are at an end. In the concentration camps, set up to hold the tens of thousands of detainees picked up in the course of the emergency, Kenyatta became the symbol of resistance and the object of a brainwashing campaign designed to eliminate him forever from the consciousness of Kenya's Africans. We were told, give yourselves up. You were deceived by Kenyatta that you would be given freedom and you will never get that freedom. Those people who advised us like that were ruining our country. They would say, you will have to rescue yourselves from here. Confess everything or you shall never be free. How do you know we shall never get our freedom, we asked. Never, they said. It is only your mouth that will save you from here. That Kenyatta of yours deceived you. You will not see independence. These people were Christians. They were educated. They kept telling us, you will never have any freedom. That Kenyatta you speak of will have to rescue himself. Already he's suffering from disease. He's more of an animal than a man. You will never see him again. You will never return to your homeland. And he will never return to his homeland. You're all like animals. This is what we were told. And we still see the same people today. Yes, even today, they are still with us. <laughs> As the British Army gradually defeated the Land Freedom Army, the guerrilla movement which had sprung up in response to the emergency measures, the colonial government permitted African politics to function again but restricted all organizations to a district or tribal level. What will you do with Jomo Kenyatta when he's released in something less than two years' time? Well, as you probably remember, when Jomo was convicted, the magistrate at the time recommended that he should be put on what is known as a restriction order. What does that mean? That means that an order is signed by the governor restricting, restricting his residence to a particular place in the, in the country. The order may restrict him to a mile of the place that he's living in, half a mile of the place he's in, even a few hundred yards. Will that place be in Kikuyu country? I doubt it. We haven't actually made up our minds yet as to where he's going to be, but I certainly don't think he'll be allowed to come back to Kikuyu country. <laughs> But in spite of the rise of a new generation of politicians, most of those who had worked with Kenyatta in the past remained loyal to him, as the European minority took to itself the right to decide who was or was not acceptable as an African leader. Jomo Kenyatta is the father of the African nationalism and the African national movement in this country. But surely you're all rather more advanced than he is in your thinking about politics. Wouldn't he embarrass you if he was really let go now? We cannot be, we cannot in any sense be more advanced than our teacher and master, whom I think is much more advanced in political outlook in this country than we are. We are still in just in the stages of learning politics from him. Kenyatta, now under restriction, had been moved to Lotwa, still in the northern desert. He was joined by his fourth wife, Ngina, and was allowed occasional visitors. He's alert, he's capable, he's completely well informed, and I am satisfied with him as the leader of this country. Elections in 1961 brought an African majority into the Legislative Council for the first time. But until Kenyatta was released, the leading party, 
the Kenya-African National Union, refused to participate in the government. On August the 14th, 1961, Kenyatta came home. So many people came because the news just spread out uh, like wildfire. And Mze tried to speak to them. And I remember his first few words. He said, I am very happy to be back with you, my people. And after that, pandemonium broke out and nobody could hear anything anymore because of cheering and laughing and dancing and everything that went on at Gatondo on that day. He tried to climb on a vehicle that was there so that he could see more people and people could see him. And that even made it to us and everybody came rushing. And that was a very great day for most of us in Kenya. When do you want independence for Kenya? Today. What means are you ready to adopt to achieve independence? Constitutional means. And do you condemn Mau Mau violence and oath taking? Well, I have never approved of any violence at all. My leadership has not been to darkness and, 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 and death, but to light and prosperity. We must show the world that some of them has been wrong, that some of them have misunderstood us, and it's only by our action they will know that we mean business. Brothers, I think I have spoken enough in this language. It is not my wish that I should be speaking to you in a foreign and for that matter in colonialistic language. <laughs> This was a man who they had met for many years and he had worked with them, he had stayed in their villages and they just grew confidence and there was nobody who could have replaced him as a leader in Kenya. As you know, even when he was in detention and we founded our new party, we still declared him as the president of that party, although we didn't know whether he was going to be released or not. And there was nobody in Kenya who could take the leadership from him. And now it only remains for me to present to you, Mr. Prime Minister, these constitutional instruments which establish Kenya's independence. Now, from sweat, there's something. You see, this car here, my brother used to travel in this before he was arrested. They took it when it was in good order from my brother's house there. But when damaged it, they okay. tore it right here. This was a lovely car when he was using it. This is a quite lovely car. Hanson Terraplane, very strong car. But now it becomes crops. After suffering, for a long, long time for his people. He's rewarded now with the nice cars and the other things to pay, to repay his things which were taken by the government. You see, I don't think he was sorry that he was detained. I think he knew that God has plans for him. He didn't doubt about it. He always foresaw that God had plans for him. 
and to come back to help his people. As a man in power, Kenyatta surprised some of his old friends, as well as some of his old enemies. Just after he became prime minister, he went to Nakuru, in the heart of the old white highlands, to address for the first time the white settlers. Some of you heard Kenyatta, you say, oh, that's a horrible man, I wouldn't like to see him. <laughs> that's a horrible man. <laughs> but here I am, ladies and gentlemen. I am just a human being like yourself. If I have done mistake to you, it's for you to forgive me. If you have done to me, I say, it's for me to forgive you. I think some of you have been maybe worried what will happen if Kenyatta come to be the head of the government. <laughs> he has been imprisoned. Maybe he has been given trouble. Well, now, let me set you to rest. That Kenyatta has no intention whatsoever to look backward. We are not going to look backward. We are going to forgive the past. Within three years of independence, Kenyatta's moderate policies were challenged by an opposition party led by some of his closest colleagues from the pre-emergency period. No one, not in my position, can appreciate the feeling of sadness at this parting with my old friend and comrade, Mze Kenyatta. We worked together in Kao for many years. Both of us were arrested on the same night, subsequently tried, and either detained or imprisoned for nearly 10 years. Three years later, the opposition party, the Kenya People's Union, was banned. Oginga Odinga, its president, and the man who had resurrected Kenyatta's name during the emergency, Bildad Kagia and Achiengo Neko, who had been sentenced with Kenyatta at Kapenguria, and several other politicians, were detained without trial. Make no mistake, this has not been the order, or orderly formation of a valid opposition party. There has been no privilege based on the honorable division in terms of high political principle. Here we have met an, an endeavor which hoped to make such impact as to destroy national stability and deprive the people of their constitution, constitutional right. It has it has failed. I appeal to all people to rededicate themselves and work harder so that we can achieve our goal of complete economic independence. Thank you. You know Mze Kenyatta has fought, he has struggled, and he has even suffered a great deal because he wanted independence and freedom for all peoples of Kenya. This in itself is very important. Besides, he has brought hope and pride to a people who have been oppressed in the past, to a people who have been colonized, and now they have elevated themselves to the status of other free human beings in the world and for a people who have suffered such a long time under humiliation of colonialism and people who are regarded as subhumans by other people in their own country this independence pride and also the feeling that people are as human as anybody else is probably one of the greatest contribution that 
any man can make anywhere in the world. Yeah. 